Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today, returning is one of the highly demanded scholars, Dr. Jason Reza Giorgiani, author of Prometheism, Lovers of Sophia, Iranian Leviathan, Prometheus and Atlas, and a ton of more books. But today, we get the pleasure of talking about Prometheus, one of the more fascinating characters in mythology. Who is he? What is his story? We have fragments. We have different writers like Aeschylus who talks about some of the stuff that happens in his in his myth. But uh, let's put it all together in one spot. So, Dr. Johnny, first of all, welcome to Gnostic Informant again. I'm glad to have you back on. Let's talk about Prometheus and what exactly is, if we put together his myth into one coherent story, what is it? So, Neil, uh, first of all, great to be back on. Always a pleasure. Um, the thing about the myth of Prometheus is that it isn't nearly as widely known as it ought to be, uh, to the point where you have to wonder, and after all, this is a, a Gnostic-oriented program, you have to wonder whether there hasn't been some kind of archontic suppression. Because, you know, many Greek myths are the subject of countless children's books and film adaptations, right? Even Hollywood films and so on and so forth. But here we're dealing with a myth that spans from the war of the gods and the titans to the creation of mankind, to the great flood that destroyed a worldwide human civilization, right? Um, I mean, the myth of Prometheus is unparalleled in terms of its monumental scope, uh, addressing all of the key turning points of, you know, the, the creation, uh, evolution, and potential past destruction of mankind. So why is this myth as obscure as it is? I think it's because uh, the, the essence of this myth is a call to rebellion and self-determination that's extremely threatening to any reigning establishment. And so in the classical world, this myth was already being suppressed because it was a threat to you know, the Olympian uh, world order of that time. And then as this myth transformed, and we'll discuss this into a Luciferian form mm. after the advent of Christianity, particularly you know, um, from the Middle Ages through the Renaissance uh, into the early modern period, when Prometheus is rediscovered and reappropriated by particularly romantic authors like Byron and Shelley and Goethe and so forth. Prometheus yet again became a symbol of insurrection and, and human self-determination that was threatening both to the church and to the state. And so this is why I think that, you know, um, it's been rendered far more obscure than it ought to be. And, uh, and so let's uh, unpack, you know, the, the core symbols and, and, main uh, twists and turns of this very powerful, uh, I was about to say epic, but really what it is is a tragedy. And in fact, as we'll get wow. into it, Prometheus is the first known tragedy in the recorded history of human literature. Wow. That's fascinating. So uh, where should we start? Should we start maybe with the sources? Just a review of... Yeah, because uh, I, know, I know you got in Hesiod, you have a lot of Prometheus stuff happening with you mentioned Deucalion and the flood Prometheus sort of plays this role and I almost wonder if there's an older proto-indo-european myth that predates the Sumerians and this myth because he looks like he's playing the same role Enki's playing in Sumeria where he tells well Enki tells uh what a Gilgamesh or whoever hey build a flood because uh Anu's gonna flood everybody out but in, in the in the Hesiod myth he's like it's just Zeus doing that it's the same thing and then you have Aeschylus but I'll, I'm jumping ahead now. But yeah, let's let's get to the sources, sure. So there most certainly is uh, both an Indo-European predecessor or prototype for this myth and also a Sumerian one. And actually, since you went there, let me just run with that, sure. that basically the myth of Prometheus in its Greek form appears to be a synthesis of the myth of Enki with uh, the story of a figure called Amirani. And so um, let me start with the lesser known one. 
Ami Rani is a fire bringing Titan that was worshiped by the Scythian branch of the Iranian peoples hmm. uh, who lived in the Caucasus. Now, of course, you know, if anyone knows even, even uh, you know, the littlest bit about the myth of Prometheus, they know that Prometheus was bound in the Caucasus by Zeus. This is where, you know, it's the site where he's punished, tortured for having been the benefactor of mankind. So in the Caucasus Mountains, there was actually this cult of Amirani. And uh, you had uh, the Scythians worshiping a Titan who waged war against the gods and who brought fire to mankind and taught uh, humans metallurgy, including how to forge weapons. And you often, seen, you often see imagery of Amirani in uh, particularly what's present day Georgia, which used to be, um, you know, uh, a Scythian Iranian territory. And in fact, the last remnant of the Scythian people, the Ossetians, still live in Georgia today. Wow. Uh, and so in, in that area of Georgia and Ossetia, this, uh, you know, stronghold of, of the Iranians in the Caucasus, you see this imagery of Amirani holding a torch in one hand and a sword in the other, you know, symbolizing the fact that this fire that he stole from the heavens and brought to humanity was used as a fire of the forge, uh, including in order to empower humanity to basically declare its independence from tyrannical and unjust gods. Uh, so this Amirani figure also winds up being chained and attacked by the eagle of the um, tyrannical lord that he leads humanity in a rebellion against. Wow. And we'll come to this later as part of, you know, the various episodes in the myth of Prometheus. But ultimately, Hercules, or the Greek Heracles, frees Prometheus from, you know, his, uh, his uh, torture, uh, being chained to this rock. And he does so by shooting the eagle of Zeus through with arrows. And this is part of the Amirani myth, that there is this figure who the Greeks called the Scythian Hercules, and who the Ossetians refer to as Batras, and who uh, the Eastern Scythians called Rostam, Rostam is Saxi, Rostam the Scythian born, hmm. who becomes the epic hero of the, the uh, Persian national epic, the Shahnameh. And so this figure in the Amirani myth is the one who comes and frees Amirani by shooting this eagle through with arrows. And this was such a, a, a uh, widely disseminated and deeply entrenched element of Scythian folklore that the people in Ossetia to this day still have a tradition of destroying eagles' nests when they find them as a uh, reverence of, you know, and memorialization of um, the freeing of Amirani. So clearly there are these elements of the Prometheus myth there. And it also, uh, it also is worth mentioning in that regard that the Parthian dynasty of Iran were descended from Scythians. They adopted the Persian, um, you know, imperial culture and the legacy of the Achaemenid Persians, but they were not Persians. They were descended from Scythians. So they were more nomadic barbarian people who then came and took over the seat of the empire and created the second empire of Iran, the Parthian empire, which was the great rival of classical Rome. Right. And these Parthians had a myth that was so important to them that it was the basis for the iconography on their coins. These Parthians had a myth that Perseus stole fire from the heavens mm. and brought it to mankind uh, and established the order of the Magi in order to be the guardians of the eternal flame on the earth. Mm. And according to this myth, Perses, the son of Perseus, was the patriarch of the Persian people. Wow. Now, this is interesting because... In the iconography of Perseus slaying Medusa, Perseus is looking away from the head of the Gorgon as he severs it. And it's been noted by art historians that the iconography of the bull slaying in Mithraism has this same uh, posture. And you don't find it anywhere else in classical art. 
Mithras is looking away from the head of the bull as he slits its throat. And in Mithraism, Mithra is portrayed as going to battle against Zorvan, who is basically Kronos, the lord of time. And look, this becomes very significant to the myth of Prometheus. So Mithra overpowers Zorvan, and Zorvan was depicted as a gorgon. Hmm. So the Medusa imagery in the myth of Perseus is like a later reiteration of this archaic Mithraic idea of Mithra, namely what becomes later per Perseus, slaying the Gorgonic lord of time and appropriating its power in the form of the severed head, right? And, but looking away from it at the same time. And this same figure steals fire from the heavens, brings it down to earth. His son is the patriarch of the Persians, and he creates the order of the Magi, namely the priests of, of Zarathustra's religion, right. to be the guardians of the fire. And uh, there are a lot of elements, uh, you know, of the teaching of Zarathustra, like the use of the term Titan of Wisdom, to refer to Aura Mazda, the main symbol of, you know, the religion being the eternal fire, the main quality of Ahura Mazda being forethought, which is a synonym of Promethea, the root of the name of Prometheus, forethought or thinking ahead or the progressive mentality, the forward-oriented mind. Right. Uh, and so you can see that there's this older Indo-European, particularly Iranian matrix of the Prometheus myth coming from out of the Caucasus, which is a general region of Zarathustra as well. He was a little bit further to the south in, in, um, uh, around Lake Urumye in uh, Iranian Azerbaijan, but same general region around the Caspian Sea. And it looks like what happened is this myth fused with the myth of Enki. And how did that happen? Well, the Persian Empire you know, emanating from out of Persia, from out of like the territory right above the uh, Persian Gulf, took both Mesopotamia. And then, of course, you know, the Iranians were native inhabitants of the Caucasus. So it, the Persian Empire connected the territory where the Sumerian myths were prevalent with the territory where you had the myth of Amirani in the Caucasus. And these two somehow fused so that by the time Hesiod, is living in Anatolia, which again is part of the Persian Empire. Right. Hesiod was a citizen of Iran. Uh, well, in Hesiod's time, actually, it was slightly before the Persian Empire, but the Medes were already very dominant right. going into southern Anatolia. And then the Medes and the Persians joined together to create this empire. In any case, um, the territory where, where Hesiod uh, winds up basically... Um, functioning as this bard and, you know, uh, laying this you know, groundwork for, for uh, Greek folklore becomes a core part of the Persian Empire. And I think that these two myths fuse there. So what's the other one? The myth of Enki, which is about how there's this conflict between two brothers among the Anunnaki. One of them wants to create mankind as a slave race to serve the various purposes of these gods uh, who came down to earth from the heavens. And this other one, and that's uh, Elil, Elil or, or Enlil. And he's a storm god, basically Jehovah. And his psychological profile is, is more or less identical to that of Jehovah in the Old Testament, Yahweh. I think even El comes from that, right? El, exactly, yeah. yes. So, it's El, yeah. And then, um, yeah, and Elil, it's interesting, Elil, La. Uh, la illa il Allah, the Muslim, you know, yeah. thing. There's no God but El. You could re re think about, they translate it these days. They love to say there's no God but God, you know, as if it's some universal universalistic statement. You're of this like abstract monotheistic theology. But really, in a way, you could read that as saying there's no God but El, namely yeah. Elil. And the letter, and the, the, the Semitic Aleph, whether it's Arabic or Hebrew or whatever. <laughs> That's the that's the L the it's that's the letter you use for L. It's not he, not it's not hell because you you use a, a het for the letter E. So people yep. don't realize that it really is A L. It's yes. not E L, but they, it's pronounced E L. But yeah. Yes, it's all the evolution of the L cult. Right. And this, this L bastard wanted to create us as a slave race, uh, meant to just you know serve the purposes of the Anunnaki.
Well, well, either, since we're on the subject, I noticed they po- they try to polemicize this um, this Titan mythology because they make it look like these are fallen angels that are giving metal urgy and fire to Enoch, and, and this is in the, this is in the, in the myth of Enoch, where you have Azazel and Samael and all these different fallen demon angels or whatever they are, and they're you know they're falling in love with the women and they're they're teaching men how to use fire and teaching them how to use metals, and you're like, wait a minute, are they polemicizing the other myth? And that's probably what's going on. Absolutely. Now, I was going to wait to get to this, but look, it's just so this, you know, we, we, we're in a better flow here. Let me just say it right now, that in the myth of Prometheus, it said that Prometheus didn't just bring fire, you know, didn't just steal fire from the workshop of Hephaestus on Mount Olympus and bring it as a gift to mankind. Prometheus taught humanity the various arts and sciences, Prometheus teacher in every art is how Aeschylus puts it. And so Prometheus in that Greek version of the myth is performing exactly the same function. Teacher in every art brought the fire as a means to mighty ends, Aeschylus says. Mighty ends, like the way Amirani uh, taught humanity how to use this fire to forge weapons, among other things, among other metallurgical you know crafts right 